Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I see you're all coming into our wonderful webinar. Oh, it's great to see everybody, all my friends, everybody that we know, know each other. If you can walk, you can dance. Talk, you can sing. Rock, you can roll, yeah, you can do almost anything yeah anything if you can think you can dream if you can dream you can fly fly you can seek seek and you will find the missing piece to the puzzle of your life the one that disappeared just when things were going right Close your eyes and you will see A broken world is A world of possibility Master Croupier Don't seem fair But now you've got to play So double down With an angel from above Stand your ground And soon you will discover The missing piece To the puzzle of your life The one that disappeared Just when things were going right Close your eyes and you will see A broken world is A world of possibility You can roll, yeah, you can do almost anything Think, you can dream, if you can dream You can fly, fly, you can seek Seek and you will find That missing piece to the puzzle of your life The one that disappeared just when things were going right Close your eyes and you See a broken world is a world of possibility. Thank you, everybody. That was our special in-house singer, songwriter, composer, Arlen Bennett, who we love and adore. And we love to play his video opening because it's so hopeful. I want to welcome everybody today. Turn on, video. Turn on my video. I want to welcome everybody today. Um, in New York, it's a nice, cozy, rainy day, but we're, we have everybody from all over. Uh, and um, I'm glad you're joining us because we have a great program. I am Susan Lust, director of the Parkinson's Wellness Project. And PWP is an independent nonprofit organization promoting better awareness, education, and social interaction for people with Parkinson's. We are geared to provide educational events and promote wellness strategies for our PD community and their families. And we're here to help people take active responsibility for their own health. We keep coming to you with more programs because you know why? Because your responses are always so positive and motivating for us. And that's why we keep making these programs. 
So how do we find our star-studded cast of professionals? Well, we do have a terrific research team at PWP that is out there scouting the pros um, in, the, in the PD field. And also our wonderful sponsors connect us with many talented doctors and clinicians. And we spend time to get together discussing the needs of our community and they are always there to help us. So today I'd like to thank each one for participating with us and making our program possible. I'd like to thank Lydia and Mike from Kaiwo Kirin. I'd like to thank, you should, see, you'll see on the, the logos there, their link is there. And I'd like everybody to just take a, 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 a peek at that when they have time because uh, it's important to know what our sponsors are providing us. We wanna thank Luke from Abbott I want to thank Vikas from Accorda and Francesca from Acadia today. And um, their information helps us to be more informed when we talk to our doctors. So today's program, Get a Jump on Parkinson's, is inspired by the two-week inpatient rehab program at Northwell Health in Glen Cove, Long Island, New York. I heard Dr. DeRocco speak many years ago at the JCC in New York City, and I was very taken by his strong belief that exercise was integral to the success of living well with PD. He is on a quest for helping the PD community and his new program at Northwell Health is the only one of its kind in the United States. He has a great team and today you will get to hear all about it. We will have time for questions at the end of the program, so please send any questions you have related to the program today in the chat. And when you registered, we have taken note of all your questions as well. Now, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Elizabeth Kira, a very talented neuropsychologist who has been a panelist for PWP, and today she is here as our moderator. She has a special relationship to the Northwell Health a system because she completed her internship in neuropsychology at LIJ North Shore under the leadership of Dr. Paul Mattis. Dr. Elizabeth Kira is the director of the Division of Psychology in the Department of Neurology at the Neuroscience Institute of Hackensack University Medical Center. She is ABPP board certified and she had her BA in psychology as an honor scholar at New York University and completed her PhD in neuropsychology at, at the Graduate School of City University of New York. Dr. Kira has co-authored numerous publications and presented on a variety of topics in neuropsychology. And thankfully, she's very active in community organizations. I'd like everybody to welcome our host today, Dr. Elizabeth Kira. Thank you so much, Susan. I really appreciate um, being here and getting a chance to be a part of this. As a neuropsychologist, I especially can appreciate the fact that uh, treatment of Parkinson's disease is also is most often multimodal, and we really need to be able to integrate all of the different specialties to have a comprehensive approach to improving quality of life in patients. So that's why I'm so excited to be a part of this. Um, I'd like to just spend a second to uh, introduce our next speaker that will talk to us a little bit about this amazing program. Um, Dr. DeRocco, as uh, Susan Lust already mentioned, will be speaking to us. He serves as Director of Northwell Health's Movement Disorders Program. He is a Professor of Neurology at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell in Hempstead, New York. He served as a founding director of New York University Langone Medical Center's Marlene and Paolo Fresco Institute for Parkinson's and Movements Disorders. He's also on the board of directors of the Parkinson's Foundation, and he's a past president of the Melvin Yar International Parkinson's Foundation. Dr. DeRocco is also on the organizing committee of the World Congress of the International Association of Parkinsonism and Related Disorders and on the editorial board of Neurodegenerative Disease Management. Um, so I, 
if if we can, what I'd like to do is just give uh, Dr. DeRocco the chance to speak for a little bit. And then what I'll do is I'll introduce Dr. Rubin. I think what we'll do is kind of split up the talk so that Dr. Rocco can tell us a little bit about the science behind this amazing program. And then Dr. Rubin can tell us more about the specific services at Glen Cove Hospital. Dr. DeRocco. Thank you, Dr. Kira. And um, thank you, Susan, for inviting um, us to discuss a program which is really um, important to us and, and, and something that fills us with, uh, with a lot of sense of, uh, of meaning. Um, so let me tell you about what sort of has inspired this program. And there are, I would say, two major inspirations. Um, one is uh, the same philosophy that we have learned uh, or that some of us have learned. Um, about dealing with, uh, with this disease is that uh, medication alone or even surgery alone, just um, not enough to deal with the disease that is so pervasive and that permeates every single aspect of, uh, of a person's life. And that um, an intervention on well-being, especially on the physical well-being, but beyond that as well, is important at uh, each and every stages from the disease, from the very first moment. Um, the the Parkinson um, Parkinson is, is diagnosed and, and becomes part of a person's life, to the um, the progression through the the, the years um, with different modalities. Now, obviously, as the disease progresses, unfortunately, the challenges become uh, more severe. And what can be the continuum from, you know, an exercise to uh, a more structured uh, intervention or rehabilitation becomes important. And many times um, that passage is just not available, that link. Uh, I, I remember hearing so many times through, through my career, people say, okay, well, uh, you're recommending that I do physical therapy, that I do occupational therapy, that I do speech therapy, that I do this other um, form of, uh, of intervention. Um, and then, you know, I'm starting with the physical therapy and I'm discharged after two sessions because they feel that, you know, they don't have anything to offer for someone um, who has my condition. Um, and this is true uh, to, to this day. Um, the um, sort of other uh, um, sort of inspiration came uh, by working with uh, our colleagues uh, around the world. Um, and uh, interestingly, rehabilitation as a, as a sort of a, um, a more dynamic uh, life uh, in many other parts of the world. But I, I was fortunate to, to meet colleagues who had started this program um, in different countries. It's the, the program as the one that we will be discussing of this intense rehabilitation um, for people who are you know, having some very specific challenges um, has been in place um, in many different countries for at least 15 years. And the, the benefit um, has been documented, reported, published, um, so much so that um, national health systems um, in different countries, including Germany, Italy, um, and other, um, uh, other countries, um, consider this a priority treatment uh, for Parkinson's disease. So the question was, why not? Uh, we are in a, in a, in a wonderful um, country with uh, great uh, resources. Um, and uh, I was fortunate uh, when I joined Northwell to, to really join uh, a community um, that was very much centered on, on the care mission. Um, and I, my, everything is in life, you know, some, some is uh, um, sort of drive and some is uh, pure luck. Um, and I must say that I was lucky to meet Dr. Rubin, um, who is a, an extraordinary leader um, and one of the, um, probably the most inspiring uh, physicians um, uh, with the double expertise in neurology and rehabilitation and a fantastic team um, at Glen Cove um, where she works and leads um, a unit. Um, and from there, um, 
the idea was grew to to sort of um, develop um, such a program geared specifically to people um, who are struggling, uh, people who are not at the very early stages of Parkinson, but people who start having more problems and often more problems um, walking or being independent to lead to um, less mobility, to stay at home more, to, to, to really diminish um, this vital force of, of uh, um, uh, activity and oftentimes becomes a little bit of a, of a spiral um, with more and more challenges that, that occur. So this has been the inspiration um, and or the synthesis of the inspiration because in reality, you know, the, the program has enriched in many different ways um, in this short time. Um, and it's each enrichment as, as somewhat of a story behind, including, um, as we'll see later on, with, uh, um, with a great, um, some great talents like David Leventhal, who will be um, part of this program a little later on. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. DeRocco. If it's okay, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce Dr. Dr. Rubin. Is that all right? Um, so Dr. Rubin is a neurologist at Glen Cove Hospital and assistant professor of neurology at the Zucker School of Medicine. She completed her MD at Bishkirsky Medical Institute in Russia and was chief resident in neurology at North Shore University Hospital. She did her fellowship in neurorehabilitation at North Shore University Hospital in Manhasset and is affiliated with Glen Cove Hospital at Long Island Jewish Medical Center, North Shore University Hospital, as well as Northwell Health and Neuroscience Institute. Welcome, Dr. Rubin. We're interested to hear more about your programs there at Glen Cove. Thank you, Dr. Kira. Uh, thank you, Dr. Duroko, for your vision and for your leadership. Um, and thank you, Susan, for inviting me today to uh, tell our story and to tell our audience about our program. Um, in early 2019, uh, we decided to create something very special, um, a comprehensive rehabilitation program for patients with Parkinson's disease that would produce meaningful and lasting results and give our patients what they need the most, quality of life and independence. In May of 2019, we treated our first patient. And as of today, despite several closures for COVID-19 pandemic, we have graduated over 80 patients with Parkinson's disease. These are patients with moderate to severe uh, disease uh, that are admitted to our Glen Cove inpatient rehabilitation program for two weeks. And I'm pleased to tell you, and I'm very proud to tell you that every patient who experienced this program had made significant functional recovery. And many of them called this program life-changing. So how do we achieve these results? What do we do differently and why in, we are so much more effective than, let's say, home therapy programs or outpatient therapy programs. In fact, many of our patients failed home therapy or found that the results they've achieved were quite um, poor and um, insufficient. The reason why we're so successful in bringing our patient to independence and um, back to independence is the way we approach the patients and approach their problems. We work differently. When people are admitted to our program, they are not, they're not seen just one therapist or two therapists or even three therapists. You become a focus of a multidisciplinary comprehensive team of clinicians that include a neurorehabilitation physician, a movement disorder neurologist, a 
physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech and language and swallow therapist, recreational therapist, neuropsychologist, clinical pharmacist, nutritionist, and a social worker. So you can see at least 10, 10 highly trained and experienced clinicians are focused on you and your problems and your way to wellness. Your treatment plan is individually tailored to meet your goals and to find the ways of to solve your functional disability. We can always, we always modify, we can modify the um, medication for Parkinson's disease if necessary. Um, we can address other medical issues, for example, blood pressure control, sleep, anxiety, um, bladder and bowel impairment. You can see internist, the internal medicine physician, um, you can see specialists um, that you may need, psychiatrist, podiatrist, ophthalmologist, cardiologist, urologist, just to name a few. All the specialists will come to you while you're receiving the rehabilitation therapy. And then, of course, the best part is the therapy itself. All our therapists are highly trained. They completed the Parkinson's Foundation-based training in PD rehabilitation. They have expertise and experience to deliver the results you need. Together with the therapist, you create a plan that each patient develops based on their own um, desires and their own needs. Very often, patients don't even recognize the difficulties they have. And our therapists are able to bring this to their attention and find the way to modify them when they become major barriers. We'll listen to you. We know what you need. You tell us what you need, and we work on the way to solve um, your problems, whatever they are. Balance, fall prevention, strength of voice, swallow problem, gaining independence in self-care. We keep our patients very busy during the day. They are involved in at least three hours of individualized therapy. We use special technology that is designed to uh, treat uh, Parkinson's patients. And then we offer two hours of group therapy. Um, quite a busy schedule. And during that day, we not only mend your bodies, we also lift up your spirits. And uh, the recreational therapy that you're going to hear about is such a reliable source of um, joy and satisfaction for patients consistently. Um, they enjoy music and art uh, chair yoga and meditation, dance. And these things are instrumental in um, creating the experience that is unforgettable and so healing. So much fun. So well received. And uh, you get to meet new friends and make new friends during while enjoying it. What could be better? 
we also want to help your families. We want to help your caregivers. They take care of you, but they need to be taken care of as well. We invite them to join us. We educate them, we train them, we support them. And this is the essential part of the lasting success. Yours and ours. So we can't wait to treat more patients and make a difference in many more lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rubin. That was such a great introduction to what your program can offer. Uh, before we go on to speaking to the therapists about some of the specifics, there is uh, a question posed from someone in the audience as to whether the program is suitable for uh, par- patients with Parkinson's that might have an added component of dementia. Um, mild dementia uh, would not be a contraindication to re- to join us. Advanced dementia might be a, a major barrier, but we would welcome patients who have mild cognitive impairment. We will try to work with them and help them to um, improve the interaction with the outside world and maybe improve the attention and the concentration it will be part of the therapy we offer. You know, I think it's so important as a neuropsychologist just to mention this. Um, many times patients come in the office and they say, I think I have dementia. And what they mean is that there's been some sort of cognitive change, but it doesn't necessarily always equate to dementia from the specialist perspective. Um, and so uh, what I would say also is that, and I'm sure you would agree, uh, kind of student making sure that the patient's need, needs are, are addressed oftentimes involves that first step of being identified. And that would involve, for example, being seen by a specialist such as yourself, a neuropsychologist maybe doing an evaluation, things like that so that they can see. Because oftentimes people will say, I'm not remembering as well, but it's not necessarily always a memory issue. Sometimes it's just slowed processing, um, especially with Parkinson's disease. And that's so common. And those are things that can be addressed and that can be helped. Uh, Can you speak a little bit about what that initial identification or referral process is like for patients that are looking to come to your program? Who is it usually that identifies and brings this up to them? Would it be their movement disorder specialist or another physician? How do they get to you? Certainly. Um, The usual way of uh, admitting patients to the program will um, consist of several, several steps. The patients are usually identified in the clinics, uh, in the movement disorder clinic, or identified by the um, neurologist in the community. And they refer to us for screening. Um, We need to uh, establish the need for this type of therapy, for this type of intervention. The screening is is usually um, um, provided... um, executed by me. I see patients um, in, in the consultation in the consultation, and um, prepare the full report about the f- uh, neurological and functional impairment, including cognition, including functional limitation, um, and including the prior uh, um, attempts to intervene in with home therapy or with patient therapy, which not necessarily uh, delivered the results patients are looking for. And putting this comprehensive report together is once is the initial step. That reports a report is sent to the insurance company, and um, I'm pleased to say that Medicare and most of the commercial insurance plans will pay for this type of intervention. Um, if, but that is will require um, prior authorization uh, to admit to uh, to the to, to be admitted to the unit. Once we receive the prior authorization from the insurance company, we uh, are welcome to, we we, we welcome the patients to uh, join us for two weeks, for two weeks stay. That's great. Dr. Uh, DeRocco, do you have anything to add um, in terms of maybe telling us a little bit about the efficacy of this kind of a program? Well, I could tell you that the 
um, as Dr. Rubin um, has, has highlighted, um, we are, uh, we of course, measuring the efficacy. You know, this is a, this is a way in which uh, a program, um, every program needs to, to sort of use what we call metrics. So use sort of kind of objective ways in which we will look at uh, how much better uh, the walking is, how much better uh, the voice or the swallowing is, how much better is our, our number of functions. Um, this is kind of our dry uh, sort of measures, um, but those are very important because these are, uh, for one thing, uh, the reasons why we can have this program uh, available to people who have Medicare or have insurance because we can demonstrate um, that there is uh, that there is a benefit. Um, the second is also from you know more academic point of view. You know we we. Um, we realize we're doing a pilot. I mean, the, the value of a program like this um, is certainly helpful uh, for the, uh, the many people uh, who join the program. But um, what really matters is that people from uh, anywhere and everywhere, if this program works, if this kind of approach of intense, focused, uh, personalized rehabilitation works, that as many people uh, in the country can have access to that. And the way in which we can be helpful uh, to this is to um, show that we have been able to do it as a pilot program and um, showing that there is a benefit. But most importantly, in terms of benefit, I think it's the definition of Dr. Rubin. Um, what, um, it doesn't really matter if uh, on, a, on a scale, on a computer, you, you move faster or whatever. What matters if your quality of life is better um, after putting two weeks of hard work um, mm -hmm. Into, into this program. If you go back home and you're able to uh, re-embrace aspects of your life mm -hmm. um, which have been lost. So I, I'm going to ask one more question here. That, there's some uh, questions that are popping up uh, in the Q&A and in the chat, and then uh, maybe we can move on to the therapists. And Dr. DeRocco and, and Dr. Rubin, feel free to jump in to answer this, either one of you. We already spoke. One of the questions was if Medicare covers the program, and I believe, Dr. Rubin, you already covered that, that the answer is yes, thankfully, as well as some commercial payers as well. Um, another question is whether you have to be a resident uh, to uh, participate in the program, as well as if New York is the only location for this type of a program, if you are referred, do you have to, can you be evaluated by your local neurologist or would you go to Dr. Rubin for that uh, evaluation prior to entering this program? So are you a resident? Is New York the only place that has it available? And do you have to be evaluated um, by, by yourself, Dr. Rubin, before entering the program or can it be any of the neurologists? Um, to answer your question, you don't have to be the New York resident to it, it the, uh, to to um, to enter the program. In fact, we have um, treated patients um, that reside in New Jersey or Pennsylvania or even farther states, uh, but they all need to be referred for initial evaluation that is completed um, at um, Glen Cove um, Hospital by a neuro rehab physician. Uh, which would be me uh, at the moment, in order to um, identify the needs and qualify the patient to um, be uh, a part of the uh, intervention. So the answer is yes, you could be residing anywhere else, not necessarily in New York, but you need to be evaluated by Glen Cove Neuro Rehab Specialist in order to come in. That makes sense. Also, one more question. Uh, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure that I address everybody's before we move on. Um, somebody wanted to know specifically about uh, whether the, the dyad of the working between the uh, care partner as well as the, the actual resident of the program, what specific uh, programs are there available? And are there separate programs that focus only on the care partner or is it always the dyad? Uh we certainly help our caregivers and our families. Um, things were different before COVID. We were actually inviting the families to stay with us for two weeks if they wished to do so. And they could be um, um, sort of 
um, present at um, every step of the way of the loved one being um, retrained, re-educated, uh, brought back to independence. The uh, joint um, experience is invaluable. And we offer this to many families. Um, we could, you could come for the weekend. You can come for a couple of days. You can stay for the whole two weeks. At least that's what we practiced before the pandemic. Currently, the situation changed and the visitation privilege, uh, the privileges are different. Uh, the admittance to the hospital is different. Um, future will tell uh, what we, how can we modify the existing, um, existing approach. But we uh, certainly are able to provide educational training via um, telehealth, via um, FaceTime uh, joint sessions in therapy, when the loved ones can actually watch and observe. We currently have partially restored uh, visitation privileges and they can come, the families can come for four or five hours a day and again, be present during the therapy sessions and speak with the therapists and get first-hand experience. Uh, but um, at the moment, it's a bit um, different. Okay, very nice. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rubin and Dr. DeRocco for uh, your talks, very informative. I'd like to just move on now and have some of the therapists speak to us about the specifics of what they do day in and day out. So if I could just introduce them, we have Angela Russo, who uh, graduated with a doctoral degree in physical therapy from New York Institute of Technology. She's been working at Glen Cove Hospital since 2015 and specializes in the adult neurologic population. She is the primary physical therapist involved in this Parkinson's program at Glen Cove Hospital. She completed allied team training for Parkinson's and is a member of the Parkinson's Foundation. In addition, Angela is a certified brain injury specialist. Uh, she's also involved in collaborative care counsel and safe patient handling at Glen Cove Hospital. Next, we have Trina Fischetti, who is a speech-language pathologist that specializes in speech, language, voice, cognitive, and swallowing disorders in adult neurologic populations. She's received specialized training um, from the Parkinson's Foundation's ATTP, which is the Allied Team Training in Parkinson's program, the Speak Out Voice Amplification Program developed by the Parkinson's Voice Project, um, as well as neuromuscular electrical stimulation for swallowing and myofascial release for swallowing. She received her master's degree from CUNY Queens College in 2006 and has been a graduate student and clinical instructor since uh, 2011. Then we have Tanique Troya, who is a uh, recreation specialist. She's been that for the past 10 years and worked with adult and geriatric populations for over six years exclusively. She's been working at Glen Cove for the past year in this program. And last but not least is Katie Schlosser, who graduated in 2011 with a Master's of Science in Occupational Therapy from Sacred Heart University. She spent three years at Northwell's Stern, Northwell's Stern Subacute Rehab and discovered her passion there for neurorehabilitation. At Northwell's Transition of Long Island, an outpatient neurorehab facility, she had begun working with the Parkinson's population and she became LSVT uh, Big Certified, which many of you may have heard about or participated in yourselves. Katie is ATTP trained and a certified brain injury specialist. For the past three and a half years, she's been working at Glen Cove Hospital on the in inpatient brain injury unit, as well as with this Parkinson's program at Glen Cove. So welcome to all of you. Um, if I could just have you guys start to speak a little bit, um, I'm sure uh, you know better than any of the rest of us all of the intricacies of the specialized work that you do every day and what a difference you make in patients. So go ahead and give us a little bit of an introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Katie. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, a little bit about a, a program and, and, of course, occupational therapy and, and what uh, we focus on. Um, so... When you're admitted to, to the program, you'll be admitted onto a neuro rehab unit um, at Glen Cove on the second floor of our hospital. Um, currently, we're admitting four patients into the program at a time uh, with the goal of up to 10 patients um, on our soon to be newly renovated unit. Each patient gets a private room with a bathroom. Um, we encourage that you bring uh, your own belongings such as clothing, uh, appropriate footwear such as sneakers, um, 
so that you're ready to exercise, move around, uh, be able to walk uh, appropriately. Um, in addition, you can bring your own assistive device if you use one, um, such as a walker, a cane, a rollator. Um, this way, the physical therapist can uh, evaluate and assess if it's appropriate, um, a safe device for you to use. Um, if not, um, recommend a more appropriate and safe device. Um, the day after you're admitted is evaluation day. Um, and that begins bright and early at seven o'clock with me. Um, some of you may not be a, a morning person and that's kind of the feedback that we get initially, uh, but there's a specific reason for that. Um, the reason for that is so that I can evaluate how you're doing with your self-care, um, mobility related to those um, self-care tasks, what we call activities of daily living um, in a more real time frame um, at the beginning of your day. So if you're not familiar with occupational therapy, the focus is um, improving your independence and safety with self-care. So uh, when I talk about self-care, I mean grooming, hygiene, toileting, um, getting in and out of your, your shower, be it a tub or shower stall, um, getting dressed, bathing, getting on and off the toilet, uh, and managing your hygiene. Um, in addition, I'll assess the mobility of both your arms um, the strength, coordination, uh, posture, balance, and how that impacts your ability to complete all those self-care tasks. Um, in addition to all of that, we'll talk about your home setup, uh, just so that I can simulate as best as possible uh, during the intervention and treatment times, um, how we can help you better and, and make sure everything is, um, you know, as is in your home and improve that, that safety and, and you know, improve your mobility regarding self-care and, and ADLs. Um, after the evaluation, we'll talk about your personal goals, goals from an OT perspective. So come up with an individualized uh, treatment plan tailored to your needs, uh, your personal goals, um, and how we can make those things that are meaningful to you uh, safer, um, get you moving around better. Uh, more independent, because at the end of the day, that's that's the goal. Um, what's important to you is important to us. Um, in addition to that, uh, I might make recommendations as far as assistive devices, um, durable medical equipment, such as a uh, commode, raised toilet seat, uh, shower chair, grab bars, um, things that may make meal prep easier for you. Um, and that's the reason why I need to know uh, your home setup so that I can better, you know, guide you and, and make those pro appropriate recommendations. Um, upon discharge, you'll get a home exercise program, um, resources that, that can help you continue to maintain and improve um, on all the improvements that you make throughout your stay with us. Um, so you'll get your schedule in the morning um, at 8.30. That's when breakfast is, is uh, served. Um, and you'll have your schedule for uh, speech therapy, physical therapy, and uh, when your recreational uh, therapist is available to see you as well. Um, so moving forward, we'll have Trina speak next. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, so in speech therapy, there's a couple things that we assess. We st I, I always start off with swallowing function. For a few reasons. First, um, it, eating is my favorite thing to do. So I want to make sure that you're able to do it well, that you're able to enjoy the things that you want and to be able to do it safely. Um, swallowing disorders are called dysphagia and it can, they can really take effect at any stage in, in the disease process. Um, frequently people will come in and say, no, I'm fine. I have no problem. But then as we're kind of assessing a little bit more, they'll say, there, there is some pill dysphagia. So when I swallow pills, I have some difficulty. When I delve a little bit further, yeah, sometimes there are certain foods that if they're too dry or too big, I'm not chewing enough, um, the food will stick. People will frequently uh, complain about saliva management. There have been some difficulty with drooling at rest without realizing it. Um, and as time goes on, one of the things that can happen is aspiration. And that's really our biggest concern because it, it can be deadly and it is one of the leading um, reasons for hospitalizations. Um, so I will assess all of that. We will do trials. I will give you food to eat and drink. 
see how you're doing with it, see if it's causing any throat clearing, any coughing when you're drinking, because those are all indications to us that something could be going wrong. Um, the program not only focuses on let's fix what we find to be a difficulty right now, but also our goal is to maintain your function. We know that it is that this is a degenerative process. We know that things can get worse, but we also know that with diet, I mean, I'm sorry, with exercise, and um, we can maintain that function. And that's really our goal. Um, okay, the next thing that we will look at is speech and voice. Um, speech difficulties are called dysarthria. The speech can become less precise. There can be some slurring, which can make um, the intelligibility a little bit more impaired. And then um, the voice. So 90% of people with Parkinson's are at risk for having some sort of difficulty with voice. Typically, it's a weaker voice. And um, it, really it really has a significant impact on their ability to communicate effectively. You know, I've heard people tell me that they've really removed themselves from many social situations, from pleasurable things, because they feel that either it's too much effort for them to be involved, or they feel like they're not being listened to. And, you know, it really takes an impact on your mental well-being as well. When you feel like you're not being heard, where, you, where you know, you're not being paid attention to, or it's just so much effort that you say, forget it, I'm not even going to bother. So it, that's really so important for me to be able to have you communicate with your loved ones. Um, the next piece that we assess is also language. So there is a difference between the physical speech and being able to say Think the words clearly and to be able to be heard clearly. Um, and, but there, there's language. So it's more the words, finding the words that you want to say, understanding. As Dr. Kira said earlier, the, the processing, sometimes that can start to take a little bit longer as time goes on. So we look at that. There can be some word finding difficulties that occur over time that can be very frustrating for people and can also cause people to kind of shut down and not want to be as involved. And those are all things that we can work on. Um, the last piece that I assess is the cognition. And again, as Dr. Kira said, you frequently hear people say, oh, it must be dementia. But sometimes it isn't to that extent. And we, our concentration changes over time. Our memory changes, our ability to problem solve. And those aren't things that are necessarily unable to be helped. So we work on that as a program altogether. You know, each person does have their individual needs and individual difficulties. So we really try to focus on finding where your most difficult things are, what the things are that are bothering you the most, and really tailor the program to make the most for you, um, and to really get the most out of the two weeks that you have with us. Um, everyone gets the, the three hours of therapy every day. And then the, it's a, um, also recreational therapy also adds in a couple, uh, one to two hours at least. Um, hopefully we'll get back to doing groups a little bit more. Um, so it is a two week intensive program. We find that because it's so intensive, because you're getting the therapy every single day from each discipline, we really do see a significant difference over time. But I think the other reason that we're seeing such great outcomes for people is that it's very collaborative. So the, the therapists all talk to each other every day. We talk about where your needs are. We um, kind of will figure out if you're having more difficulty with the one thing with another, how can I help out or OT and PT? How can we make that all work better together? Um, we also have a team meeting once a week where we discuss discharge planning, plans for home, any difficulties that we anticipate you having when you go home. And then we discuss these findings with you, with your family. There's a social worker that's involved, as Dr. Rubin said earlier, that serves kind of as the, the liaison between us and the family, um, in addition to us speaking with the family. Um, the, the social worker will help not only with the discharge planning throughout the stay, but also when you go home. 
we know that we make significant gains and we know that people are maintaining those gains. But part of that is to continue the exercise programs that we give you to continue with that patient. Because although even if someone hasn't done well with um, outpatient therapy in the past because it's not enough, now that they've had this like kind of kickstart and really gotten everything going, we hope that we want to maintain all of that. And we do feel like continued therapy after discharge is a great way of doing that. Um, we also do before and after videos for mobility. I do it with voice. But the thing that I found really, really interesting um, as we're watching back these videos when people go home, um, you know, my goal is also, it has always been to be able to show, look, your voice was here when you came here. Now after two weeks, look at the difference. But I've also gotten so much feedback from people about how different they look. They'll come in, they're kind of slumped down, they're not making eye contact. And then after the two weeks, we're sitting up and we're talking and we have a smile on our face. And I think to me, that's one of the best things about the program. It isn't, you know, obviously the functional gains are what you're there for, but I feel like people feel so much better about themselves, about their abilities, about wanting to rejoin the things that they had been missing, um, reconnect with family. I've had patients tell me that they wanted to go back to work at occupations that they felt they weren't unable to do because of certain losses that they had. I had a daughter tell me that I gave her dad back his dad voice. I'm not sure if that was good or bad. <laughs> he, he did do some yelling at her, which was great. <laughs> um, but overall, I really think that it's because we do so well because we all work together so well. Um, and on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Tanique and she will tell you a little bit about what we do in recreational therapy. Oh. Tanika, I think you just have to unmute oh. yourself. <laughs> there, there you go. go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Uh, my, again, my name is Tanika. I'm one of the recreational therapists at Glen Cove Hospital. We also have a wonderful art therapist, creative arts therapist on, on staff. We, uh, like Trina said, we also, and Katie as well, we do an assessment. And we meet everyone, we speak to them and have a conversation about their, you know, past leisure interests or maybe something that they would like to begin. We have a lot of people who have liked art but never really tried it. And that is one of the things that people actually enjoy so much that they start buying um, materials before they even go home. We like to ask them their game preferences, um, if they like relaxation therapy, if they like music, what kind of music. And we just like to have a, a good conversation with them just to see what are some of the things that they used to like to do and would possibly continue to do post uh, discharge with us. Um, we encourage the patient's participation for our one to two groups a day. We are actually running groups. We don't like to say we are social distancing because we want everybody to be social, but we are just a little bit physically distant <laughs> in order to, uh, to be safe. But we are having groups. We run art groups. We do social games, uh, which can include bingo, pokino, um, we do a lot of cognitive games like trivia, Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, of course, modified. We have adaptive sports and exercises and relaxation therapy, guided meditation. And we also have a spiritual group, which is Hope and Wellness, with one of our chaplains from uh, Glen Cove Hospital. Uh, like Trina and Katie said, and bringing in physical therapy, of course, we do focus on all of these domains. So we try to focus on cognitive, emotional, physical, um, spiritual, 
and just have a overall um, group activity where we can just one have fun but also work towards our goals and one of our main goals is to have the patient get back into the community or get back into their leisure interests uh, and be be social be confident bring up your self-esteem and be in a supportive environment we run support groups as well and this is somewhere where the patient can talk to other patients and share their stories, share their experiences and share other resources that maybe they didn't know about. Maybe we had, for example, we had a few patients that would share uh, phone and computer applications, things that would help them remember things or shopping lists, uh, things for relaxation and just different um, resources that they share off of each other has helped a lot. Um, they feel really comfortable. They support each other. And we're just there to facilitate. We're another, uh, as a recreational therapist and art therapist, we help people express themselves creatively, emotionally, spiritually. And that is one of the main things that we try to do is just have them do things that they they really enjoy doing, whether it's physical or artistically or musically. Um, we do a little bit of everything. We speak to each other We, we for speech uh, with physical therapy. Maybe we do some exercises, some sports for occupational therapy with some games and including art. We work on dexterity, fine motor skills, and that could also help them post discharge once they're home helping you know feeding or grooming or just regular ADLs so we we try to be the the fun glue that we we put everyone together and we just um we see each other hopefully twice a day try to do the groups and we also do one-to-one sometimes you know we need that little one-to-one uh connection in order to just share, just share. And we're there, we're there, we're available for the patients for a different, um, whether it's emotional or just a game or just listen, we're, we're there in different aspects. Very uh, nice. Thank you so much, Tanique. I'm wondering if we could hear a little bit just from uh, Angela Russo here on the PT before we move on to another section. Hi, everybody. My name is Angela Russo. I'm the physical therapist involved in the Parkinson's program. And basically, when you meet me, we will be doing our first initial evaluation. Um, I will be assessing your transfers, how you go from sitting to standing or from moving from surface to surface. Um, I'm assessing your functional mobility, how you're walking. I do a quick gait assessment to see what are you struggling with the most in regards to your Parkinson's. Um, do you deal with the freezing of gait? Are you shuffling a lot? Slowness of movement? Is your posture an issue? I'm looking at all of that. In addition, um, assessing your balance, your coordination, strength, endurance, and stair climbing. Following my evaluation, we come up with goals together. And these goals are set they're individualized, you know, I encourage my patients to tell me what are the specific things that you struggle with the most, whether it be at home, being able to climb up the flight of stairs you need to get to your bedroom, to the bathroom, um, or are you doing pretty well in the community but have given up on certain things that interest you? You know, I've had patients in the past say I used to golf a lot. And I've given that up just because my balance is not so great anymore. So we develop a treatment plan with the goals set in mind and focus heavily on what their specific goals are. are. My treatment plan consists of a lot of different tailor fit exercises, balance activities. Um, we do a lot of walking together. And um, if stairs are a barrier, of course, we, we, stair train. We um, come up with safer ways to negotiate the stairs so it's safer. Um, in addition, on evaluation, Dr. DeRocco touched on this a little bit. 
We utilize specific outcome measures, which is just a fancy word for special tests that we use. Um, it's a way to quantify each person's progress. And we are lucky enough to have an iPad available to videotape each patient just to gain a before and after video. Um, we repeat the special tests on discharge just to see how they progressed. Um, one of the tests is the timed up and go. It basically times how long it takes a person to stand up, walk about 10 feet, turn around and walk back to their chair and sit down. Um, the longer it takes a person to perform this test, the higher their risk for falls are. So we see a baseline, how they do on evaluation and repeat the test at discharge just to see how they improved. And we've been lucky enough to see so much progress. Most of the time our patients have um, great improvement and we see that. And a lot of them are very impressed to see the video to see how they did before and how they're doing now after discharge. Another test is very similar. It's um, the five times sit to stand test. We measure how long it takes someone to go from sitting to standing five times in a row. Um, and again, if it takes a long time, it places them at a higher risk for falls. We have a subjective measure called the PDQ 39. It is a questionnaire and it takes into account the patient's perspective, how they are dealing with Parkinson's and how much they feel it impacts their lives. And we found that it's again repeated on discharge. We found that people find things to become easier following their rehab stay with us, um, which is great. So um, in addition, once we get to that discharge portion, you know, the two week stay is up. We, we really encourage family members, the caregivers, whether that be a spouse, um, a son, daughter, or a sibling, whoever the primary caregiver is, to come in for a little training session. And we train and show them the safest way to, to guard the patient during walking, during stair training, just to make sure they're safe. And we highlight all the ways to, to reduce risk for falls at home. Um, our program has a lot of state-of-the-art equipment specific to meeting the needs of individuals with Parkinson's disease. We have in addition to regular rolling walkers, rollators, canes, we have a U-step walker, which for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a, it's a type of walker made with Parkinson's in mind. It's a more stable device that is more easily maneuverable during turns. Um, it also has a seat. So if you fatigue easily, there is a seat attached to the device. Um, it's made with a built-in metronome that will provide the, the beat to sequence your steps and keep the pace. It also is made with a laser that will give you a visual target so you can take longer steps. We also have a machine, it's called the Biodex Balance Master. Um, it provides a little bit of virtual reality. So when you're standing on it, you will have a, a tablet in front of you and we could play different games on it. It works to improve your weight shifting outside of your base of support, um, also working to improve on obstacle negotiation. Another machine we have is the Biodex Music Assisted Gait Trainer, which is a treadmill that can be used in conjunction with a harness. We have an overhead harness system in our gym. So if someone is not steady enough to be on a treadmill, we can um, secure them in a harness to make sure it's safer for them. This treadmill is also made with a built-in tablet that's going to provide biofeedback. It's going to give you encouragement. If your steps are looking good, if you're taking nice long steps, it'll tell you good job. But if your steps are too short, it'll tell you take a longer step. This tablet also is made with Spotify. So we ask our patients, what's your favorite type of music? Let's walk to the music and try to walk to the beat. And it really is helpful with people with Parkinson's disease. Music has been shown to be very beneficial in um, improving their gait. So we plan for the future to invest in more equipment that utilizes technology such as that virtual reality. So we're very excited for the future. 
And this program at Glen Cove Hospital is continuing to expand. Our 10 bed unit will be newly renovated uh, within this year to accommodate our vision. And we are all very excited for it. Thank you so much, Angela. I'd like to take the opportunity now um, just to reassure everybody, I am seeing your questions and answers. I'm just going to save some of them to the end. I would like to introduce back Dr. DeRocco so he can speak to us a little bit about the next segment that we're going to be seeing. Um, I believe I'll be introducing um, David Leventel uh, now. And um, uh, many of you uh, in the Parkinson community know the name David Leventel, and uh, certainly you know that's for PD, or that's for Parkinson disease. So um, the program uh, created the, the, the this is, the program is, is reductive, it's really the movement uh, created by um, David Leventhal uh, of the um, Mark Morris uh, Dance Company is, uh, I think, as something extraordinary. Um, it's, um, it's bringing uh, the grace of dance um, and, and classical dance and ballet uh, training into the world of Parkinson that is intimately challenged um, in, uh, in expression and movement. I tell you, as everything has a story, uh, um, I met um, uh, David Leventhal some 15 years ago, actually uh, reminiscing a um, uh, few days ago. Um, I was invited to one of the very first um, um, to the demonstration of uh, Dance for PD. Um, and I, I had actually um, uh, an opportunity to see people uh, with Parkinson whom I knew uh, who were, with whom I was working as a, as a neurologist. And I was literally um, transformed uh, by the experience um, to see this energy of music and dance and grace and rhythm of movement um, that had such a transformative uh, effect on, on people. Um, in addition to being fun, and in addition to be uh, a great way of, uh, of, of connecting. That was 15 years ago. Um, since then, Dance for PD has become really a world uh, phenomenon. Um, and um, th this technique uh, and this way of uh, bringing the grace of dance and music uh, into movement as a form of exercise and I must say um, really healing exercise or restorative exercise has been um, now embraced um, really throughout the country and beyond throughout the world. Um, relevant to uh, our prior discussion, um, and of course, we have been admiring uh, the work of David Leventhal for uh, a long period of time. Um, and we will be um, partnering uh, at the Glen Cove um, uh, Rehabilitation Program for Parkinson. So that's where PD um, will be part of the rehabilitation uh, and uh, movement uh, treatment techniques that we will be, will be offering with um, uh, in-house dancer from the Dance for PD program. Um, personally, David Leventhal is one of the most charismatic, one of the brightest, one of the most engaging, and one of the most committed individual I've met. And um, I uh, really think he's been um, as I said, one of the most transformative forces in the world of parties. Alex, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be able to be here and to share uh, some of what we do with this wonderful audience. And I also want to share with you how excited we are to be partnering with you and the Northwell team to bring Dance for PD to the incredible center that you're building. Uh, one of the things I think that's really important when we're thinking about activities for people with Parkinson's is that they are engaging, enjoyable, creative, and fun. And 
from the uh, anecdotal evidence that we have from offering this program for almost 20 years and from the research evidence um, and the literature that's out there, we know that dance provides many of the elements that people living with Parkinson's need in order to live well. We focus on balance, coordination, musicality, and rhythm, but we also focus on connection, self-confidence, self-esteem, and uh, sense of mood elevation. So all of these things come together in a delicious, enjoyable package that we call dance. And I'm just so thrilled that dance is going to be part of the incredible center that, uh, that you and the team at, at, uh, at Northwell are building. Uh, it's uh, also important to keep in mind that dance has a way of reaching everybody at whatever level they're at. So we want people to know that they can be creative and expressive and physical, feel confident in their bodies, regardless of what is going on with them in their Parkinson's journey. So our classes can be done seated, standing with support or standing without support. And whatever level people are at, they're engaged, they're creative, they're enjoying themselves, and they're getting the benefits of a dance experience. What I'd like to do, Alex, uh, if it's okay, is just share a couple of activities that I think get at the core elements of what dance can do. And those four elements are physical engagement, cognitive engagement, and skill building, expression, this chance of having to of, of having to speak with your body, of having to say something, um, and finally, the sense of social connection. When we're dancing together, when we're creating artistic meaning together and doing something with music together, we create social bonds. We create that sense of belonging. So even if people are not staying at your center for a long time, they're there for a couple of weeks, they will have that sense of belonging and connection that I hope will last with them when they return to their communities and they will seek out similar activities to sustain them, to support them, to help them manage their symptoms with dignity. The other thing I think that dance is really good at doing is giving people a skill set that they can take and carry with them wherever they are. That may include using music to help them walk. It may include using choreographic concepts, this idea of sequencing to give them uh, a sense of a trajectory in their movement to, to help them know what move follows the thing they just did so that there's a logical flow to their movement patterns. We also use imagery in dance and imagery can be an incredibly valuable tool in helping people manage their daily lives. If there's something that's particularly difficult, like turning a corner or getting out of a chair, you can use an image that works for you to support you through that movement. That's something that dancers do and that's something that individuals can do and carry with them in their daily lives. So I always encourage people, whether or not you're in an actual dance class, to think like a dancer and use those skills of music, image visualization and sequencing, choreographic sequencing, to help people manage their days with, with dignity and grace. Without further ado, I thought I'd lead us through some activities. So I'm going to back up a little bit so that you can see me a little bit more fully, I invite you into my home studio here. And I thought we would start with some painting. What I'd like you to do is to imagine that the space around you is covered in a a white canvas. So it is waiting for you to add beautiful color and texture. And we'll start in with, with that right now. What I'd like to think about is this idea of tracing a line. And you can allow that line to go in whatever pattern and speed feels comfortable to you right now at home. But what I'd like you to do is to visualize that line See the color you're creating on that canvas. Transfer your paintbrush to the other side. Pick up where you left off. And continue that line all the way around. Pick up a second brush now and allow both hands to trace. Now I'd like you to experiment with circles. How many circles and loops can you create with your brushes? 
can always change direction. And I'd like you also to think about the canvas around you, behind you, under you, and over you. So we're really thinking about all of the directions 360 degrees around, as well as above and below. Now I want you to think about only straight lines and right angles. You think about the wonderful modern artist, Kate Mondrian, painted a lot in these linear patterns, boxes, rectangles. So what does it feel like to change your brush stroke, to move with a more directional brush? Now I want you to drop your brushes and just paint with your fingers. Gently pressing that paint onto the canvas. Thinking about the texture. What does it feel like to have that oil paint kind of squeezing through your fingers? What does it feel like to press that paint onto the surface of the canvas? And what does it feel like to smear that paint? I'm going to invite you now, if it feels comfortable, to smear that paint, even smearing it on your own arms and hands, so we can get a little bit messy with this paint. Really smearing it. And now that your hands are covered in paint, I want you to think about splattering that paint, Jackson Pollock style, onto the walls, onto the canvas, allowing that paint to spring off allowing the energy of that splattering to come out of your fingers, out of your eyes. Don't forget that canvas behind you and above you. You can use both hands at the same time or one at a time. I want you to collect now all of the color, all of the lines you've created, bringing it into one ball of color taking one breath and allowing that paint to expand out to the world, opening, 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 and relax down. And just take a moment now to enjoy everything you've done on that canvas. Take a look at all the colors and all the lines. Allow yourself to sweep a little bit side to side through that. Great. We're going to keep that sense of flow going and focus now on a little bit of Argentine tango. So what I'd like to do is, is really three elements. One is what we call adorno. Adorno is the same kind of patterning that we were just doing, this sketching, but with your feet and legs. So take a moment to find a smooth pattern you can do a circle on the floor. You can do a figure eight, if that feels right, or you could sign the letters of your name. Okay, whatever feels comfortable for you. We'll do that on the other side. We'll also bring that Adorno up into our arms a little bit. So exploring that sense of smooth motion. We'll also work on some direction. So we'll do front, side, back. I'm just going to turn a little bit so you can see going backwards in a chair, right? And side. And we'll bring in our cha-cha. The cha-cha is a slow step, a slow step, a quick, quick, slow. Slow, slow, quick, quick, slow. We'll also bring in a dip. So I want you to imagine you have a partner, imaginary partner, and you're going to dip your partner gently to one side, bring your partner back up and dip your partner gently to the other side. So I'm really feeling my weight down into my feet and pressing against the floor, keeping that sense of a hold in your arms, okay? Now with all of this movement, I want you to think about being as dramatic as feels comfortable to you. This is a very expressive dance form. So use the music and the texture of the music to find your own expression. All right, let's try this all together, a little bit of tango. 
starting with some nice circles and shapes on one side, switching to the other side, again, tracing that pattern on the floor, whatever works for you, taking that same sketching idea now into your whole arm, and on the other side. Great. You're going to keep this arm and add the other leg. Again, keep it simple, nice circular action. Let's change to the other side. Great. Let's go with our direction. So we go front and in. Every time you come back to center, feeling that nice solid base. Same thing to the back. Good. And to the side. Let's try on the other side now. Reach and back. Same to the side. And in. To the back. Right, planting your feet in the center every time. Let's go into our cha-cha, so nice heavy steps. One, and slow, quick, quick, slow. Let's try that again, slow, slow, quick, quick, slow. Again, getting a little bit of a sway in your upper body. And quick, quick, slow. One more time. Really feeling the weight of your feet into the floor, right in time with the music. And widening your base a little bit, taking your partner in your arms, dipping that person forward, and coming back, transferring to the other side, and leaning pushing against the floor to come back up. Great, let's try that one more time. Keeping your arms nice and full, dipping and using the pressure on the floor to come back up, taking a breath here and reaching over and back. Great. Let's go back into our Adornos. Starting with one foot, adding the same arm on that side. You can do whatever you'd like, any shape, any direction. You have lots of freedom here. Let's shift to the other side. Any pattern, enjoy the flow of this music. finding a nice solid base, and I thank you so much. All right, good work, everybody. So that was just a little taste of what can happen in a, a Dance for PD class. You should know that we do a lot more than that. We do uh, always offer the choice for people to stand uh, with support, without support. Um, and we also, as you can see, we draw from a range of different styles, different kinds of music um, in order to give you a very full um, experience of, of different kinds of dance from, from all over the world, different types of choreography, um, and, and of course, different music that inspires us, that gives us direction, and that shows us a path. So uh, we're so excited again to be able to partner with uh, Alex's team and with Northwell to make sure that dance can be a vital component of rehabilitation at this incredible center. And I encourage you to learn more, to ask uh, Dr. DiRocco as much as you can about the center, and of course, to share any questions you have about the Dance for PD program uh, with Susan and her team, and uh, we look forward to being in touch with you. And I'm going to send it back to Alex. Thank you so much.
what an amazing program Dance for PD is and what an amazing example of how we can find everyday activities that are pleasurable but can make them into therapeutic activities and how amazing that it can be collaborative um, and that the Glen Cove program has this as a collaborative and ancillary therapy. I think it's just wonderful. I'd like to ask, ask uh, Dr. Duroco to come back on and share with us um, some patient success stories. We're lucky enough to have a couple with us today. Thank you, Dr. Kira. I um, like to introduce um, um, really uh, two great individuals. Um, and um, I'm sorry, let me just. Uh, and um, where's Alan and Shifra? Here we are. Can you hear us? Yes, we hear you. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, I had, uh, can you hear me now? Yep. We can hear you. We just don't see the camera for Alan and Shifra. I don't know if they have their camera off or... The video's on. <clears throat> and we'll we'll have the picture up. We'll have the we'll change the screen in a minute. Hold on. Okay. Well, let me just um, briefly mention that. Um, here um, <laughs> Shifra. It's so good to see you. Hi. <laughs> and I would. Um, I was struggling in, in ways to, you know, define the many years we have, we have spent together. Um, I don't even remember how many, but we met um, at the beginning of uh, Alan's journeys with uh, Will Parkinson. Um, and that was uh, uh, when we both were uh, much younger, uh, less great. Um, and... Uh, and has been has been a journey. Uh, certainly, there have been challenging times, and there have been great times. Um, and uh, Alan, at one point, uh, was uh, over a year ago, or well, way before COVID, so well beyond a year ago, a year and a half ago. Yeah, uh, joined us at the uh, at the program um, at Glenco, and. Um, I, um, and of course, you know, that was at the beginning of the program. And um, you heard um, the voices of uh, the therapists, of Dr. Rubin uh, and others that you know, work on the program. I think that it's important now to ask um, Alan and, and Shifra about their experience. And um, the, the first, uh, question and actually echoes some of the questions that are in the chat is uh, what kind of improvement, what is it on a practical level that you notice uh, after your stay in Glenco? I should know. Um, hi. After Glen Cove, um, I think Alan's overall well-being improved. His balance improved, his stamina improved, his daily living skills improved. He was just more available to be a better father, a better husband, a better friend. It really made a big difference all around. And if there is one of the activities, one of the things uh, that define the experience there, could you sort of think of uh, the, the one favorite thing, the one favorite experience at Glen Cove? I think the best thing just for me is with being able to watch the therapist so that when something was happening at home, I could say, uh, how'd we do it over there? What did they tell you? And just to know what they were doing and be able to transfer at home was huge. Right. And uh, along the line, can you sort of kind of uh, highlight some of the practical tasks that uh, you learned uh, during the, the stay at the rehabilitation um, unit that you were able to bring back home. 
Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I I found it. Um, the thing I found most beneficial were the towns. The way that the the staff over there it was just so helpful. It was mind numbing. They took some stuff, uh, pers- personal uh, items, you know, not uh, issued by the hospital. And they wor- worked on it to, so that I could make it complete. It was very helpful. He had specific things he wanted help with, and they, they listened to him, and they really worked diligently to make it easier for him when he was able to do it at home. Thank you. And the last question is, um, during the experience uh, at Glen Cove, were you able to connect with other people with Parkinson who were uh, with you during the same time? And um, if you can tell if that was um, sort of an experience that helped uh, in any way. I think when, when Alan was there, it was mostly one-on-one. I don't remember there being that much group at the very, very beginning. So I don't remember him saying or me seeing too much interaction. That was two years ago. So I can't speak to it now. Okay. And I just want to sort of ask you uh, all together, you know, if you can, if you can sort of uh, give a sense of, um, you know, your experience and, uh, you know, you know, one summarizing uh, sort of sentence. The, uh, the experience at Glen Cove? Yeah. Right. It's pretty darn good. <laughs> um, Thank you, Shifra. Thanks. Thank you. Thank everybody. We still thank everybody. Two years later. Thank you so much, Alan and Shifra. And thank you so much, Dr. DeRocco. I would just like to thank all of the panelists today for coming on and introducing some of these um, different areas and different specialties to our patient population. Now I'd like to take the opportunity to... um, uh, ask some questions that have been posed in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, one of the questions here, and maybe either Dr. DeRocco or Dr. Rubin, you guys can answer this. Is there any follow-up data on retention of benefits for this program at either three or six or 12 months post-intervention, particularly for balance and upright posture or fog? Um, I don't know who wants to speak to that. I can speak with that and say that there is, there is data, uh, not from our experience, but data from other programs uh, in the world that, that have been doing this, to show that the, uh, the benefit is maintained, uh, is well maintained for the first six months. And then after, after the initial six months, there is a decline, especially in regards to gait and balance. Um, this has led to the idea of sort of a periodic uh, uh, re-intervention uh, either at six months or a year um, and some of the colleagues around the world um, have kind of a, a shorter uh, rehabilitation intervention of you know one or two weeks after um, a yearly um, a longer uh, rehabilitation program uh, that can occur at six months nine months months. Very nice. Uh, You know, we spoke a little bit about the type of patient that would be appropriate for something like this. And there are a lot of questions in the Q&A posted um, about whether the patient uh, program is appropriate for those that maybe are at the very beginning stages, only have a mild tremor, um, some mild shaking. What about on the opposite end of the spectrum, those who might have more advanced PD symptoms and are in a wheelchair? Maybe Dr. Rubin, you might want to speak a little to this. You, you're still on mute. Oh, certainly, I can answer the question. Sure. Um, this program ideally suited for patients with um, moderate severe Parkinson's disease. Uh, when the um, deficits are um, significant enough to be noticed and to be 
um, negatively impacting patients' uh, daily day-to-day -day activities, especially when uh, all the measures at home are not helpful and um, not producing the, the good outcomes. People with early disease may not be necessarily um, uh, uh, um, accepted to the program because the symptoms are so mild and they generally are functional and, and independent uh, with some modified uh, um, um, changes. People with advanced disease, um, people who are um, uh, um, severely impaired and haven't been uh, functional for quite some time or, or um, um, present with uh, very advanced symptoms um, um, and, um, and, and probably will not benefit um, as much. Certainly everyone would see this some improvement, but the most of the accomplishments could be achieved in that sweet spot, moderate severe, uh, moderately severe Parkinson's disease. Uh, for those that are participating that might have a particular needs, so for example, they might only be on a kosher diet or they might uh, be uh, Sabbath observers, are there ways to kind of accommodate that within the program? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we can certainly accommodate our dietary needs, and we've been doing it in the past. Our, um, our kitchen is able to um, uh, offer the uh, kosher meals, and if we can't accommodate it well, we have an outside vendor that would supply us with um, um, kosher uh, um, uh, products and kosher prepared meals. Very nice. Uh, and lastly, one, two of the, pro the questions that were popping up were related to the accessibility of the services. So one person was asking about what kind of expectations there are for the program to grow outside of Glen Cove to maybe some of the other Northwell sites, such as that on Staten Island, or for those that right now, through this new COVID era, will there at some point be a telemed uh, option for this type of a rehabilitation stay? Well, I can tell you that <clears throat> um, specifically for Northwell, uh, this is uh, where uh, we converge uh, our, our efforts. It's physically impossible for us to replicate this program um, different sites. Um, we um, realize that you know, geographically it may be challenging for people to, to come to specific location. Long Island. Um, on the other hand, is a one-day trip. Um, it is an inpatient rehabilitation, so uh, the, the, once you uh, arrive uh, at the destination, you stay for two weeks. Um, and like I said, we are uh, one of the program. We are the pioneering program uh, offering this intense um, uh, rehabilitation program for people with Parkinson. Um, However, we do hope and believe uh, that in the future, more programs will develop um, in other geographic areas and in other, in other parts of the country. Um, we know already talking with colleagues and, and that similar or not so different um, uh, initiatives are, are, are starting in other parts of the country. Um, and um, certainly the use of telemedicine can be helpful as, um, as part of what we haven't really discussed much uh, of the follow-up because once people leave um, our program and the future of other programs, it's not just a goodbye and good luck. Um, there is a way in which we, we stay in touch. Uh, we communicate with, uh, with the team, whether physical therapists or other um, therapists or other therapists to work uh, with the patient um, at their um, at their home um, but also through a telemedicine program that is expanding um, and as part of our growth uh, we will be providing uh, a follow-up for the telemedicine on the other hand that intense one-on-one -on -one, um, intervention of uh, a number of, of specialists that work together and communicate and they, they, they really develop um, a personalized uh, um, intervention uh, plan 
and the, the, the actual work can only be done physically um, in the facility. Right. Good point. Um, I'd like to actually, jumping off of that idea there that you that you were just speaking about, I'd like to introduce some of the, the um, therapists to come back and maybe describe a little bit for the patients, what is different about your program as an inpatient program versus the type of piecemeal services they can piece for themselves together at home, maybe at their local rehab whether it be that you're working as a team or that they're getting the services more intensively and, and higher in frequency every day, um, but maybe speak to some of those um, really important highlighted differences that make a big difference in their recovery. Trina, I don't know if you want to speak to it. Sure. Yeah, I, I touched a little bit about this before. And I think it's all those things that you just mentioned. First of all, it's the fact that it's every day. So that carryover. You know, I think it's human nature. We do something, we get really involved, and then we go home and we have an exercise program at home, that which we may not follow every day, um, you know, no matter how well we're intentioned we are. So here, you're doing the therapy every single day. And we're all feeding off of each other as well. When you're in physical therapy, if you're not using your loud voice, Angela will also make you do that there. If your posture is inappropriate when you're in speech therapy and Katie tells me this is what they should be doing, I can reinforce that there. So I think a lot of it is um, us all talking to each other, knowing what the patient's goals are, knowing what's most important to them um, and having that really collaborative environment. So it isn't just me working on one part, just Angela, just Katie, just Tanique worrying about all things. It's, it really is very interactive. And I think also the involvement of the families is really important. Um, it may not be so easy to do the exercise programs by yourself. The, the speak out program that I do for voice um, intensity, the cognitive um, things that we might put in place that we think, okay, these are going to be great strategies, aren't often in the things that we're going to do all by ourselves. So I think having that family involvement is really, really important. And then at, at the most, and one of the biggest things that we have too is Dr. Rubin kind of pulling it all together for us as well. You know, you have to have the medical part taken care of and the medication piece taken care of and the blood pressure things taken care of so you can be um, present in therapy and get the most out of it. And I think that that, that can be a difficult thing to do as an outpatient. And maybe Katie or Angela, um, because your, uh, your specific therapies rely so much on in-person work. You know, I know, Angela, you had spoken a lot about those specialized, um, the specialized equipment that you have there. Um, Katie, I'm sure you probably use, you know, similar specialized equipment. Maybe you could speak a little bit to the pluses to having this be something that's in person and why it's so important. Yeah. So, you know, Katie had mentioned we encourage our patients to bring whatever assistive devices that they're used to bringing, used to using at home, whether that be rolling walker, a rollator, um, we get to assess and see if that's the most appropriate device. And if it's not, if this may be a reason why this person is falling so much or losing their balance so much, we can make recommendations to say, okay, this may not be the best thing for you. Let me recommend something better to use. And we have the equipment um, to trial and error and see what works best for that individual. You know, um, we have quite a few of those use step walkers available to us. And if it is something that I recommend that I think is the best bet for that patient, we take care of ordering it for them, making sure, you know, insurance, it covers the device. And I could actually take one of the devices, place it in their room so they could practice walking to the bathroom with it, you know whether or not they need a staff member to assist, we'll also make that recommendation as well. Wonderful. And then with, uh, with occupational therapy, really, um, as I mentioned before, um, getting the patient's uh, home set up and, and getting to know what their environment is. You know, we have a simulated um, ADL suite uh, with toilet, shower stall, tub, um, 
as well as a practice kitchen uh, where we can simulate all of these tasks, you know, laundry, meal prep, um, physically stepping in and out of, of uh, these environments and kind of determining what the safest uh, option, whether it's, as I discussed before, um, a piece of equipment or um, simply installing a grab bar to make it safer, uh, you know, non-skid mat, any, any of those types of recommendations, um, you know, to make life easier and, and to make it the most in, in, independent that you can be. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to ask uh, maybe Dr. Rubin, there is a question uh, in the Q&A section asking for some contact information regarding the program, who they can contact, whether it be a phone, an email, or a website so that people who are interested can find out more about the program and who they can get in touch with. If you could do that, that would be wonderful, Dr. Rubin. Um, I want to thank everyone so much for uh, being on here today and taking your time out to speak. Um, I just, I, I always find these uh, programs so incredibly helpful. And I have to say, not just for the uh, individuals that are listening or affected with Parkinson's, but for us as professionals to make sure that we keep touching base and keep these ideas going so that we can improve everybody else's lives. So thank you so much for, for doing this. And thank you so much to the Parkinson's Wellness pro pro uh, Project, excuse me, for coordinating this. Okay. The panel was superb. I can't thank you enough. I just want to add that we we um, we will put the information in the chat on how to reach everybody. And um, it was great getting to learn all about you and about your wonderful program. And I hope our audience will get to know you as well. Moving forward, June 20th, we have our next webinar, which is going to be very interesting. It'll be about using the brain and storytelling and the impact of positive thinking with um, uh, Dr. Jui Shahed from Mount Sinai. So I hope you'll all join us. And July 11th, we have a wonderful coming back again, the music is medicine part two. It was such a great success in February. We're bringing the whole star studded cast back again in July. So please join us. So after this uh, song that you hear at the end, I wouldn't mind if everybody filled out a survey because it always helps us to help you. And one more thing, people did sign in the register that they were interested in our PWP workout classes. We happen to have awesome teachers. And if you're interested, please contact us or allow me to contact you. So thank you again, everyone, for joining. And um, enjoy <laughs> Nanad Bach. If I had another life, I would never walk straight. All the things I love to do, other people love to hate. Wear my shoes on my ears and my hat on my feet. Park the car in the kitchen, take a bath in the street. I love ping pong, I love bums. I love the Three Stooges and those crazy drums. I like lovers who don't vote the same. And lying on my bed in the stars and the rain. Oh, yeah. If I had another life, I would run, run, run. Run, run, run. Have some fun. But seriously, if I had another life, I would run for president. Feed the pigeons in the park, never pay the rent. Jerry Garcia, Secretary of State, declares money illegal, knowing that'd be great. I love ping pong, I love bums, anchovy pizza, and those crazy drums. I like lovers who don't vote the same. Lying on my bed in the stars and the rain. Oh yeah. Ooh, oh yeah. Now, if I had another life, I would do it all again.
again Run a movie from the middle Begin to get the end Try to miss the target And win the biggest score Tell my dad I love him Like I never did before I love ping pong I love bunks I love the honeymooners And those crazy drums I like lovers who don't fall the same Talking to my father In the stars and the rain Another life, if I had another life. Thank you, everyone. Big applause for our work. Thank you.